Right, so back to where we were in our migration. So we had started off our migration to AWS, which if you've ever been part of a migration, is never easy. I don't think anyone's ever been part of a migration that just is flawless. Uh, we started building out our clusters, we got into production, uh, and then the call came down that it's too expensive. <laughs> so a few people upstairs did a bit of maths and realized oh, that gets pretty pricey when you start to look at all the, uh, the licensing costs on SQL Server. Uh, and then the call came down for us to actually look at alternatives to cutting that price. At that stage, we were using dedicated instances in AWS. So nice. You can do, obviously, uh, reserved instances, save some cash that way. But our biggest cost was actually licensing. And because we chose a per core licensing deal, uh, we were actually going to be running at quite a big amount of cash uh, to go and spend. So the call came down for us to use dedicated hardware in AWS. Um, and if anyone's never used that, uh, quick highlights on that is that it's actually dedicated physical hardware in AWS with all the advantages of using AWS as tools. What that means is you have access to the physical cores instead of the virtual cores, and you can save roughly about 30% in cost saving on licensing, which is great. Getting there was a very different story altogether, though. We did have some advantages. Uh, we were running our SQL Server clusters in HA configuration, so that was great. Uh, at that stage, they were four node clusters. Uh, we've recently just added a fifth node now for more uh, DR capabilities. But at that stage, it was four nodes in our cluster. We already had a lot of that infrastructure as code in the form of CloudFormation as well as PowerShell scripts. So we pretty much had all the building blocks there, which was great. And the biggest advantage that we had was we are a six-day-a-week team. So because of all the time differences, we can run a six-day team, which is great. It's a 15-hour day. So something that Denver can start out in the morning, we can finish up in the afternoon. Uh, we could also work on their weekends, and they can work on our weekends as well. We started to look at a lot of different techniques of how we could go from our existing clusters over to dedicated hosts. And the biggest thing that we had to work towards was no downtime. We could not have any drop in availability because, well, we're migrating to AWS. A lot of people have given out uh, press conferences and saying this is going to be great. All Zero customers are going to have a better experience. We just couldn't have any downtime at all. So using what we had in our HA configuration, we decided to look at node swaps, so swapping nodes in and out of our clusters. So nodes that were on dedicated instances, we could swap for nodes on dedicated hosts. So we already had all those building blocks, but trying to put them together took a lot of time. So we had CloudFormation, we had a lot of SQL automation, uh, and our cluster configuration was all stored in source control. So that was great. The biggest thing there was coming up with that process. So how would we go ahead putting all those things together into a process that we could swap in and out? And at a very high level, this diagram is, is pretty much what we work towards. So we'd have all our clusters, we would have a new node, and we'd be swapping them in and out, which we thought, what could possibly go wrong? Well, trying to get from where we were currently with our clusters over to dedicated hardware was incredibly difficult. Um, our CEO tends to ha say this quite a bit, where you're kind of changing the tires on the bus while we hit the highway and fill up with gas without stopping. And that's pretty much what it felt like to run these big SQL server clusters and trying to do configuration changes on the fly. So we split the team. We continue to build out uh, new clusters uh, for the migration. And then we had another bit of the team looking at the automation to those node swaps. So we couldn't stop anything. We had to split the team. And the advantages of obviously having two regions for the team, we could do that, which was great. Uh, we did have to test that process extensively. We couldn't just YOLO in production, which some people like to do quite a lot. Uh, luckily, we did have a test environment, which was great to test all that stuff out. Um, we were very conscious that we could not have any data loss or any interruption of service. So those were kind of the two key things. Uh, it was unacceptable for us to lose any data, and it was unacceptable for us to go down at all. So a lot of the things that we learned from this process is that dedicated hosts on AWS are great at saving money. Uh, they're also a relatively new thing. Well, at that stage, they were a relatively new thing on AWS. And with most things in AWS, they work great on Linux, 
not so great in Windows, um, which we learned very, very quickly that a lot of automation that we could have a, uh, take advantage of was just not there on Windows. So there were things like having to bring your own image to AWS, so you'd have to take your own image of SQL Server and Windows and build up your own AMI. You couldn't just use one of their AMIs, and that was a very lengthy process to learn all those lessons. Uh, we also found that we didn't have a discovery service for these things in AWS. Their API was nice to kind of tell you which dedicated hosts were open or available to host other instances. Uh, unfortunately, our configuration meant that all clusters had to get spread across the three availability zones in US East. And just taking up the next dedicated host that was open, we couldn't rely on AWS logic to help us. So we had to write a lot of logic to find the next open slot on a dedicated host. And the, uh, the most annoying thing was that syncing large amounts of data takes a long bloody time. Uh, there were a few instances where we were taking over 24 hours in our node swap process purely because our data set was just absolutely massive. Um, so it was just one of those things of hurry up and wait, which we were, which we were really good at at that stage. Uh, the, uh, the other thing that was probably not new to us was that debugging in PowerShell is a horrible existence. Trying to figure out what PowerShell is doing some of the time and trying to go through that stack trace to figure out is just a long, lengthy process. Now, PowerShell's gotten better uh, recently, but it still has a lot of those issues. And in a way, we're kind of actively working to try and get away from PowerShell if we can. Unfortunately, or fortunately, PowerShell's got a lot of baked-in stuff for SQL Server, which is great. So we didn't have to go and reinvent the wheel. And as a product owner, I didn't want to go and sync three to six months trying to do everything in Ruby or Python where we've got a Microsoft language that does a lot of that stuff for us. May not be the best tool ever, and it may not actually be a scripting language in that definition, but it was doing a good job at that time. The other thing was that AWS services have a timeout. And while we knew this in dedicated instances, we didn't really understand that in dedicated hosts. So a lot of things were long running. You can imagine with data syncing over 24 hours, things can time out. And we only figured out that things were timing out when we got errors back. So we had to do a lot of massaging of that data sync to make sure that it was still going and not timing out. What was great about that was we could actually lean on AWS a lot for that information. They were very, very helpful. So we got in contact with our TAM, we got in contact with other engineers in AWS, and they actually helped us along. Uh, we were very much the guinea pigs for getting SQL Server on Windows on dedicated hosts. So interesting time. Uh, during a migration to try something new, I wouldn't highly recommend it, but it worked out quite well for us. We also figured out that we had to build quite a few things as well. So a, a lot of things out there are solved problems. Uh, the approach that we normally take in the team is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel, because that is really annoying, it's time consuming. Uh, as a product owner, I just want to get there quickly. <laughs> uh, and the team is then moving at a different speed. So we just found that we had to build a lot of things. So in Octopus Deploy, we built a lot of step templates to help us there. Uh, some of those are available on the community library now. So if you are users of Octopus Deploy, there are some things there that you can use. Uh, we also figured that we needed to build a metadata store for our SQL Server clusters. That did not exist uh, in the open source community. It did not exist in AWS. And we had to go and develop that. Uh, so We've created a metadata store called Dynamite, which is a cool name. We probably need to rebrand that to be something more SQL Server specific. Uh, but this metadata store would give us information about all our SQL Server clusters running in production, as well as our test environments, and allowed us to do a lot of service discovery that we didn't have before. Uh, that metadata store we built in three days. We used uh, Python uh, in Lambda, as well as a Flask API layer and we were able to cache all that stuff in DynamiteDB. Uh, and that was a really good example of us using kind of a semi-serverless approach to do that stuff. Uh, we started planning things on a Monday, and by Wednesday we had it up and running, and we were actually able to use it within our script. So that's a great, great story right there. We also built uh, much more in terms of PowerShell modules. So we did have a lot of PowerShell scripts, which are horrible to reuse. Uh, we figured we had to write a lot more PowerShell modules to get us there and resharable code. Um, 
And that actually worked out quite well for us to share that stuff out there. So that's almost like a no-brainer that you've got to do that. We're actually moving into the second phase of this now in Zero, where we're looking at building out um, a single top layer PowerShell module that we can use for all our automation as well. So those are the things that we built. We're hoping to open source Dynamite out to uh, the community. There's a few things we've got to strip away, but we found it very useful, and we figure that a lot of other companies who are using SQL Server in, product, in AWS would probably benefit from that as well. So the future of node swaps going forward is at the moment when we do a node swap, it's very much a click the button approach. So click a button, put some variables in, and you can node swap. And that's great. The fact that we have uh, you know, click the button and two variables that we need to, to put in there, fantastic. But what we really want to do is make this process very mature and have these node swaps going on just automatically. And we've put a lot of effort into doing that now where when we do major infrastructure change to actually use node swaps as an automated process. So we change some configuration. Uh, let's say we're putting some new uh, tools or modules that we want to go and deploy onto our infrastructure. We can do in-place deployments, but at the same time we want to refresh that infrastructure as well. And we want to have these things as an automated process going forward. So the approach we're taking is that when we bake a new AMI, a new AMI gets baked, gets registered, node swap should happen automatically. And using things like Octopus Deploy helps us a lot for that because there's already baked in triggers and all that kind of thing, all that kind of work that we would have to do manually, it's all in Octopus Deploy right now. Um, we are aware that Octopus Deploy might not be the best thing going forward and that's why we've made it quite gener generic so we could use other things. But that's the process you want to have going forward is across our, uh, our 110 servers is to be refreshing that infrastructure again and again and again so that we're not sitting on an old version of an AMI or an old version of um, you know, AWS drivers. We want to refresh that as much as possible. So it's very much using a, um, a cattle approach to pet servers. Uh, we're about halfway through in this new process now. Um, time is a big factor in this. Uh, when you're node swapping, like I said, syncing data takes a very long time. Uh, so when we do this, we're trying to be pretty careful at the moment, but going forward, we want this to be an automated thing. We don't want to worry about it. Uh, we obviously have monitoring and alerting around it, but this is the process where we can just have automated node swaps going on behind the scenes, and we don't need to worry about it.